Welcome to Film Buff Live. We are bringing in. We are live. And just like that. Hey, de ho. Hey, we got love already. Hey, Ami, how you doing, sweetheart? Um, how, yeah, she's here already. Look at that. First in the line. Hey, hey, what's up? we got people jumping in already. How's everybody doing today? Good evening. It's uh, it's it's not Wednesday. It's this usually I you know I used to do Wednesday with Wizzo. I haven't done that in a long time. Hello, 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 everybody jumping in. How you doing? Um, I am here under the Film Buff Show profile today uh, with William Patrick Coleman, somebody that I wanted to bring on on my gig. Uh, a while ago while I was still doing it and him being in Vegas and me being here and us not being super tech savvy, never figured out exactly how to do it. But guess what we done did? We figured Together, out how to do we it. Got it. Together we got we it. We figured out how to do it. We got we got William Patrick Coleman, we got Wizzo, and we got a party going on. That's all we need. So uh, grab yourself a drink, you guys. Grab Happy yourself Monday. some snacks. What's that? Drink on Happy a Monday. Monday. Drink on a Monday. Yeah. Just another manic Monday, baby. What are you drinking, Will? Oh man, I'm already gonna fail this interview. Uh, <laughs> it's a test. You didn't know there was it's uh, gonna be a test. It's Coca Cola. Coca Cola is. That's stuff. where we're gonna go with right now. Yeah. Better in the bottle than in the straw, and I'm just I'm sipping on a little Yamazaki. So good to see everybody popping in the room here. We can uh, wait a little bit longer for some more people to pop in. Get yourself snacks. I like uh, I like fruit and nuts. I'm a big fan. I got blueberries. What I like to do is I like to eat the blueberries with chopsticks because that way it slows me down a little bit. I get my I don't chopsticks. Like, uh, I don't like candy, but I do actually eat only gummy worms in the uh, event of an interview or some kind of a gathering or something. Yo, man. Is that your comfort here. food? Gummy worms your comfort food? Is that your yeah. comfort food? Yeah. You like keep gummy worms in your pocket for like tough situations? Actually, I'm that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy. Word, dude, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. Safety dance all the way. Yeah, tonight's got seven in the room jumping in from Gambia. I'm from Gambia. That's I. I. Uh, I. Well, um, I. Where's that? California. You know, you know where Gambia is? Yeah, Ga where's Gambia? Is, is it next to Crenshaw? <laughs> I think. I think it's some information about the Gambia. The Gambia is a small West African country bounded by Senegal with a narrow Atlantic coastline. Dude, that, that was, was totally dope. That was close. You were you were very close. You were, I mean, it's, you know, in traffic, maybe like a good day, you know? I think so. So Gambia, yeah. we got Gambia in the house. I love it. Uh, my brother, can, I, can you help me, please? Uh, I, I can help you uh, through my words. So just listen and, and take on the good words of William Patrick Coleman, and it will guide you through life, my friend. Okay. Um, so we, we are here. We are here to uh, discuss many a thing. We are here to discuss William Patrick Coleman, who some of you may know. We are here to discuss Film Buff, show season one, and maybe a little hint at season two. And uh, who has the most Yodas? <laughs> Dagobah has the most Yodas, I think. Dagobah has the most. Um, yeah, we got a little Grogu in the background here. I got a little uh, cat. I've got a... Um, uh, you know, one of these guys. We're all. We're I got all a, set. We're, I've got a Jack Skellington, an Ace Ventura, and a Doc Brown, and I'm in the best company. The best, dude. Now that's fantastic. Now that goes. Now the anxiety's the Jack, on the TV back there. There's several the Jack surrounded is, by Jacks. Jack is throwing. I know you're a huge fan of a Carrie. You said you got an Ace Ventura, and of course, Back to the Future. You. That the time machine from Film Buff is is the DeLorean from Back the to the time Future. Machine so you got from Film Buff. Yeah, yeah. You got that vibe going on in there. And so Jack, what's your you got a lot of love for Jack? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, my son's name is uh Jackson, so uh we decided to let him adopt Jack Skellington. He's a big Halloween nut. He's going crazy right now. Uh he's you got a, big a Halloween, Halloween costume nut, this so. year? Uh, I think he has a couple, yes. Uh, I'm trying to talk them into having him go as Baby Pubert so that I could go as Gomez Adams, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I really want to be Gomez, but there's like 10 things he wants to be. I haven't dressed up in like 20 years, so. Yeah, but now you have all that reason. You relive it all through the eyes of the child. Everything's different yeah. now. And the yeah. real DeLorean, I mean, you're, you're right. That's, uh, 
that was the real DeLorean. That was super dope. Was um, really so anyway, good. dude, uh, let me just say, I know, you know, that you are, uh, you're a freaking mad genius, but you're kind of a private guy. I know that you're not, you're not super stoked about stuff like this. I know you're tripping balls right now and you're like, not yeah. like Mr. I want to be interviewed and be in front of a bunch of people and have people talk about me, but we love you, bro. And we want to pick your brain and we want to know about you. So that I want to, first of all, I want to thank, thank you, thank you, you, thank you for, for, for doing this, for being here and, and for letting me pick your brain. Um, I and figured out of all of us who talk the most, you would probably be the better, <laughs> the better candidate. I have a propensity for not shutting up, so I mean, there is a that there yeah, is a problem. Were, it's an art. You turned it into an art. A problem sometimes. Um, How about that? So, so we're here. First of all, you know, let, let me let me. Hey, Jay, what's happening, brother? Um, th th this is, uh, you know, I, I want you to think uh, 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 like people. N NPR or, or, or public public television. This is this is a drive. This is it's almost like a pledge drive. We've uh, we've got a Kickstarter campaign going on right now. Papa D, my friends, I'm sorry. Please, any amount you have so that I can buy drugs for my mom, please. Well, we'll get to you on that. So here's the deal: if you need money for Ooh. drugs for your mom, um, anything left over after we meet our goal, we would be more than happy to help you uh, to help you with your mom. But I think in order to do that, you have to help us first. That's what I'm saying. We got to get this yeah. Kickstarter. We have, we have about a week left on the Kickstarter account. Um, you, had, Darrell, what's happening, brother? Um, go, go to either the film. But well, right now I notice uh, Instagram was being a little bit weird. Is it sometimes do? And um, my link wasn't popping up, but dude, we've got links all over in our stories, in our reels, um, on on Facebook. I think even on TikTok a little bit. There's all kinds of mad, and I know some of you, a lot of you who are on here, Alex, what's happening, brother? Hashtag Alex. donate today. Donate today because your dollars make it happen because you help us to create season two, which is half in the can, yeah? Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, I can't give specifics, but if I were to estimate, right. I'd say we're approaching half. And I don't know. I think my associates would say, I'd say a little less. They're, they're going to say approaching half. I know, I know you can't say too much. I know you're more tight lipped than Marvel. Yeah, like, yeah. But, but there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on. How, you know what? Film buff. Film buff. You, you call yourself a film buff. You count yourself a film buff. And you named the show Film Buff. Film Buff Show. What, like, take that back. When did you first, when did that first become real for you? When did that first become a thing for you? Is it, was it as a child? Was it as an adult? When, when did your love for film develop? Uh, for film develop or the title itself? Your actual love. Well, I'm assuming the title stems from your love for film. So here's the thing. I And I, I will go back to your, your question. But to answer that question real quick, film buff to me is not a singular person. So when people refer to the show, they say film buff. They're, they think they're talking about me in general. And to me, I, it's a broad of people. Like it's a it's a... You got over seventy people. You got you got a list of people. You got well. That's that's they're, one of the things I love about your show. It's you, you, it's a you put together a sketch comedy show, which has been done. But then you also took in this. You you incorporated these interviews into it with people like who who did I have in here? It's uh, Drew 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 Struzan. Oh, uh, Drew Stru. We got Mister Drew Struzan in the show. Um, you know, you you interviewed him. You had a. Uh, uh, David Rabinowitz, you got, I mean, uh, like, so you're, you're taking a show that's like a sketch comedy show, but you're infusing it with, with knowledge and history and interviews and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, it's much bigger than you. It's not just about you. It's yeah. about this slew of performers. You've got actors, you've got musicians, you've got artists, you've got directors, you've got. Yeah. I wanted to make a show featuring a, uh, an assortment of like a community. So to, so to say, so like to me, uh, movies consist of the best, the best choice of artists, the best in costume design, the best in uh, set design, the best in score, the best, like they get, they try to construct the best that they can to tell the story that they want to tell. So film, as opposed to like something live or as opposed to like music or anything like that, it's the only one that includes all the arts it, to come together and construct something uh, powerful. I myself uh, fell in love with film around the, I mean, too, too young, too young. 
I, I was cursed with knowing what I wanted to do at such an early age. I think when I was like five or six, and not to uh, label our our age in this at all in any way, but we were definitely the uh, the early Star Wars age. We were the birth of Indiana Jones age. We were the birth of Back to the Future age. We were birth. We were coming out of Jaws and coming into Close Encounters. You know, like '80s was a very big time for film especially if you include something like fantasy or science fiction, which we're, we're finally getting back to fantasy through a show, like Lord of the Rings and things like that. But the 90s was sans all that kind of um, crossing barrier in storytelling. By the time we got to the 90s, it was like comedy, 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 drama, drama, drama. Uh, um, but I, that's where I came from. I guess that's when I became what would be later known as a film buff, as long as well as a lot of people I knew. The show, uh, in something that a lot of people don't know, is the show itself got the name uh, as it was. It was actually the vanity license plate I had in my car. Get out! So, so I got in a, I got in an accident <laughs> that kind of injured me severely. Uh, I, I had a big uh, injury from it, and because of that, I moved to Los Angeles. I moved to pursue film and comedy and writing and things like that. But the car that I got in the accident said film buff on the license plate. So the PT Cruiser, was it a PT Cruiser? Yeah, yeah, I did. I didn't want to fucking say it in the interview. You fucking (laughs) ratted me out. Somebody else fucking ratted me out. See, there's love for you here. There's love for you here, brother. Too much love for me. There's too much love. He just ratted me out. Do you remember the first, the first film, your first recollection in a movie theater, your first recollection, the first film? Oh yeah. I I told this story uh, in uh, one of the episodes in five, but real briefly, um, you'd you'd be surprised to know it was RoboCop. (laughs) Wow. What do you think of the remake of that? So they did Uh, RoboCop, which is a fucking phenomenal movie to this day. So it's such a great movie. Um, my father took me, he, they're not so movie keen, and we were in the age of, like, X. They didn't have NC-17 yet. They had rated X for gore, uh, gore and sex, and they later changed it to NC-17 because of the sex, purely. Um, so uh, my dad takes me to see RoboCop, kind of like a father-son thing. I hate to tell you, I was, like, five fucking years old, dude. Like, I, was, uh, I was an inappropriate age. Inappropriate age, right? And so he's taking me to see this movie that's rated X because of gore. And he doesn't know it's rated X because he doesn't know what the fuck a rating is, really. And so we get there, and in the first fucking five minutes, I'm five years old, Ed 209 comes out and blasts this dude across the room. <laughs> and if you, you, can watch, you can watch this version now in what is called the uncut version because they don't have X rated anymore. But in the uncut version, uh, they might have changed that rating just for this scene alone. Like the, he's he's sprayed across the table and his kneecaps fly off and it's beautiful. It's beautiful, bro, because it is the best usage of practical effects and 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 this as a kid, this is really what I'm seeing is the celebration of all arts. But uh, my mom probably thought differently when she's at home and saw the commercial and it says rated X at the end of the commercial, but I'm already at the fucking movies with my dad. So, uh, we get home, needless to say, and he got in big trouble. Like, but that <laughs> movie stayed with me the rest of my life. And in all actuality, anybody who's seen Robocop, especially at a specific age, at like a specifically young age, will tell you your life goes one of two ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you turn one of two different people, and thankfully I, I think I turned on the more creative side of things. We'll see. That's awesome. Well, those, yeah, those are the moments that, that form, you know, that send us one way or the other or, or stick with us and, and drive us through. I do want to say real quick to anybody. Yeah, uh, Kurtwood Smith was Rick. Kurtwood Smith was Clarence Brodicker before he was uh, uh, Red Foreman to me. When he got in that 70s show, I was like, oh, there's Clarence. Oh, from from uh, the the dad in the show. Um, I want to say to anybody who's yeah yeah like Alex just tipped tipped in with that. Um, anybody that has questions, if you hit that question button at the bottom, because sometimes the the uh, hey, what you type scrolls by too. and we miss we it. We are learning it too. Yeah, it's it scrolls by and we miss it. So if you have a question, very specifically something you want to ask, Will, hit that little question mark button at the bottom of the chat. Uh, put your question in there, and then we can look in and, and see the questions and, and uh, throw some stuff at him from you so it's not just me talking all the time. Now, um, 
so that was that was sci-fi. That was you know, as your first recollection, that was sci-fi. Now something down here I had just just for me, just the stupid little thing for me. Are you uh, uh do you lean uh, Star Wars, Star Trek? You go one way. The people want to know. Oh, the, oh, the Star Wars, Star Trek. Are we talking Roddenberry Star Trek? Or are we talking Bad Robot Star Trek? Go, go. I, I, Doesn't I'd matter. Like to expand upon that. Doesn't matter. Always Star Wars. Is it <laughs> always Star Wars? <laughs> but now where, where were you? Where Good were you Star Wars, with bad that? Star Wars, early Star Wars, middle Star Wars, late Star Wars. Star Wars is but, like sex. It's it's. It's good no matter what. Like it's like pizza. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It's still fucking great. Like Star so Wars. So my question is, is, not to take away from Star Trek though. The thing is, Star Trek is more science than fiction. It's Star I, Wars I agree. Is a healthy blend between the two. It gets patriotic at some time. At, at time. Now, now, do you political. now you asked that question? You said Gene Roddenberry or Bad Robot. Do you feel that Abrams didn't necessarily do justice to like? Oh, do you? Uh, I think he adopted a new set of fans, and the old school fans didn't like that okay i don't think it's Deep necessarily throw, they like the movies because <laughs> i think the movies are handled with care i just don't think that they it's like uh you have your own club for like 40 years and all of a sudden the star wars fans are like hey <laughs> they, they come over from force awakens because jj does both of them <laughs> he, he they come over and you know they, they they're he broke the wall down really oh we share a good friend who's a vulcan i think right do we from Vegas, do you remember uh, um, AJ? AJ's uh, AJ's she, she, uh, producer. She worked. Of the show. She worked in the um, yeah, yeah. She's in yeah. season one, and she she, so she played in a season Vulcan. one. She 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 produces season two, but uh, I also have a history of her story. Is uh, I know a friend who owns artifacts from Las Vegas. You know, they, they put them in the backyard. They got this big, rich like manor, and uh, she has the Star Trek seating arrangement. She has the Star Trek seats in her backyard. So I took a picture of that and I was able to send it to AJ. That's she yeah, she she performed, I think, in that thing at the Hilton. You know, you know they yeah, had yeah, that yeah, Star yeah, Wars. The Star experience. Trek experience like she was, thing was called. She was in there as a Vulcan running around and stuff like that. So um yeah. All right. Well that's uh I I'm 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 still I'm I'm still picking your brain. I'm still jumping in on you here. Sci fi took you in took you into film. What what now would you say is like? I don't think sci-fi is your favorite genre necessarily. Do you have a favorite well, genre the of thing film? Is, is that here's the thing is that I think to me now genres are only as good as what you can blend. Because yeah, comedy is great, but a comedy sci-fi is really good. You know, an action's great, but like an action western, you know, so the the crossing of genres. So you take the the genre you like the most and find what it blends with the best. And that's probably your favorite. And to me, I like that. I think comedy goes, comedy is the only one that goes with just about any of it. Um, but it's to me worked best with probably science fiction, comedy and science fiction, because you get, you, you get things like back to the future and you get things like the most creative of movies ever to exist. Uh, um, uh, however, you know, I, I, I will constantly bring it up about every 10 minutes, but Scream has just perfected the comedy horror. There, there we uh, go. Uh, Com comedy horror, okay. So every time a movie, like, crosses genres and then they get they do really, really well, all of a sudden this movie, like, birthed the, the genre of yada, you know, they change. But, but really, it's, 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 not, it's not just one genre anymore for anything. I, 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 you know, I agree with you. I think, and I think but that, yeah, comedy that builds, just so you know. it builds for something a lot more. Um, what, what act, so then what, you've got actors that straddle that too. You know, you see, you have a lot of actors that I know one of your favorite actors, J Jim Carrey, maybe. Yeah. Okay, who, 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 who kind of got his feet wet maybe as comedy, but now you so see I mean, him doing, he didn't get like, his was, feet wet. He didn't get his feet wet. He just, he destroyed the whole pool. Like he, the guy, there's one, there's a comedian every 10 years. It's like the Elvis Presley of comedy. And to me, he was the 90s, uh, like clearly, uh, clearly. But in what in, in support of what you're saying, never before has a comedian, except maybe probably Robin Williams. They're very equivalent to each other. He was he was that for the 80s. Uh, he really was. But um, these guys have come in and not only have taken over comedy, but they've proven to go beyond that successfully. So 
Robin Williams goes on to do, you know, fantastic. Get, gets nominated for wins for Goodwill Hunting. You know what I mean? Jim Carrey comes in, and it, all of a sudden, the Truman Show the becomes the, the most like woke movie of thirty years, and it stars Jim Carrey. Uh, um, Cable Guy probably is like the top five greatest dark comedies ever made. Or the most under. Well, I was, talk I was just talking to you the other day about. I just discovered something you had already seen, uh, the Bad That's Batch, right. where like you you wouldn't even recognize Jim Carrey in that movie. Yeah, and, no, and you yeah, said you'd have to go out of your way to know that he was in it. I don't believe he even talks in that. It, 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 yeah, I don't. You know what? I don't think he does. I think all of his stuff is silent because he just he he writes some stuff down. He gestures. He, but I don't think he actually speaks. I think you're right. No, um, he says I that uh, comedy is one of the hardest of genres. That. Yeah, I, I I really agree with you. Comedy in itself is it's just one of the hardest things in the world to do because they're... Fable course, Guy, the most underrated movie of all time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, like, comedy is like is like uh, if you're if you're waiting tables, and like everybody's been a, a, a server at one point or another uh, of their life, they had to go to the table and get an idea of who they are, how they talked, and what they wanted within the first, like, 30 seconds. Uh, an actor in, in general kind of perfects that, but a comedian really hones it down and turns it into an art because you can come out and say five different jokes and that same joke, you ever see the aristocrats, you, you know, tells one joke from different points of view. It's about how you deliver it. And the person who can deliver it the best has learned what that person finds funny within their first 30 seconds. Yes, comedy can be the hardest genre, but it depends on who is delivering it. Uh, there's a difference between watching a Jim Carrey movie, watching a Chris Farley movie, and watching a Kevin Smith movie. There are comedies. They're all good comedians in their sense. They know how to construct comedy in a way. But, um, but uh, yeah, to answer your question, Zach. Go ahead. Um, I found something out about you that I thought was super cool, and this just goes to kind of show your uh, your devotion to what uh, when if you love someone or something. You told me you made yourself a promise that you would see every Jim Carrey movie in a theater that, uh, that you could. I'm a, I'm a bit of a loyalist, and you'll find out like certain things about me that I, if I'm loyal to something, I'm super loyal, and I'm Jim Carrey is. And you know what? I say this now, but I, one of the best things I share with somebody about is Jim Carrey with Alex Payne, and we both love Jim Carrey. Uh, and ever since he came out with Ace Ventura on February fourth, nineteen ninety four, and I saw in theaters, I said I'm gonna I'm gonna go out of my fucking way to see every single thing this guy does in theaters, so that I know that I'm paying for it, so that I know that I'm supporting him. And then here we are, it's fucking two thousand twenty two. The guy's fucking coming out with movies. I gotta you know, hit, get in a car and go to three hours to to a theater. Like he's still relevant, so I'm still grateful to be honoring that and i'm surprised that i've honored that uh so thoroughly but in doing so what i've done is i've committed to everything he has uh signed on for and become a part of artistically therefore i broaden my horizon with other material and other people's work which is probably something that i think it's friends with the weekend that's true yeah uh that's a great story too they became friends during the pandemic he's on his album the weekend's album actually no kidding yeah yeah uh, I mean, he's a, you, you know, that, that whole thing with him and Tupac, they were friends. They were pen pals or some shit. What? No. Yeah. They were pen pals, which, which is crazy to think that was Jim Carrey relevant like that? Are we talking in living color, Jim Carrey? Because I technically that Jim Carrey is black. You kind of get it. Like he, he's in, in living color with a sea of, uh, you know what I mean? Like somewhere in there. Right. Like, right. He's talking, like, I don't white guy, Tupac, like, yeah. like in Jim Carrey after he said, when did, I don't know, maybe, I guess. But when he was locked up. I guess, but that's crazy to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote he wrote Tupac when he was locked up. To He wrote him letters to help inspire him and feel better, actually. That's super cool. Yeah. What a, what a, dude, what a cool cat. Um, yeah, he's fantastic. But yeah, I, I, my, and my point is that, yeah, I've successfully done that. Um, I want to just, I, I want to, Right now, the first part of this, and we're going to get into some more stuff later. This is just more picking your brain. This is just more, maybe for me. <laughs> You're like, no, yeah. for me. Um, uh, something else I love about film that I really enjoy, and, and, and it's something that, that really uh, it impacts me, I'm sure it impacts you, is, is like the power of, of music, right? Of, of 
of uh, you, you've got you, with film. You've got sort of there's a it's a dire. There's two. You got a soundtrack. You got a score, right? And you look at something, and and sometimes you see things cross over. You look at like some of the Batman films with Danny Elfman, or the one that Prince did, or stuff like that. Yeah, all of um, Batman albums are great, no, right? On them. They're always um, spectacular. There's a great, you know, uh, I, I just think that music is a very powerful thing. Uh, what what is your, where do you come in on that? Like, uh, I, I know, I know, well, something like with film buff. Like I said, you got you have you have many different people working with you, you have some actors, you have some comedians, there are people directing, you have p people producing the different segments from first season because it was the sketch comedy and the stuff like that. Uh, and you had somebody, somebody wrote a song. You, you had people who c composed the theme. For well, the yeah, well, we had to because uh, the whole idea was, well, could we one day maybe sell this? I don't know. Why don't we approach the show like we could? And so I took on a musician as a producer. And in doing that, the door opened for much uh, many more um opportunity for original music for the show itself now the show itself only has about i think two tracks that we repeat throughout the whole season uh written by a, a specific artist along with our producer and that artist was buck bowen uh who is a gene this guy was great so m this is i had a little fascination with this guy because i knew his sister fawn bowen uh, who is a saint also, uh, he would come out with a music video every week on YouTube. And that was his strategy to build. And he, and he fucking did it. Like he's a hip hop artist that had a new song and came out with a new video. Like that is super hard on a weekly, but you have to plan that kind of genius. Yeah. You know what I mean, but like his songs were actually fucking good too. They were thought out. They told stories and they were really, really, I really liked this guy and I wanted to meet him. And so I used, I say used, but my producer, I introduced them so that they would do a song together. And that's the theme song that you hear, which is called. From season one. And I, and I love that. I, I love that song. Um, yeah. I, again, I know you, uh, I don't know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. Does that, does that carry over into season two? Is that. Uh, so yeah, that's a really good, interesting question. What we did. And you know what, I, I wanted to say something about, I wanted to talk about the trailer a lot more than it's been talked about, which is why it's almost repeated on every single video for the Kickstarter event uh, that's still going on now. Like if we come out with a new video tomorrow, you're gonna see that trailer, gonna be for, it's gonna be forced down your throat. However, people don't know that the score they are hearing in the trailer is officially the new theme song to season two. What you're hearing, thank you, cheers. Spoiler it's alert. It's done by a musician <laughs> named uh, Spencer Motometti. Guy's a fucking genius. He's great. Uh, he does score. Uh, um, he's super good. And what I wanted was a different feel for the new season. Like, I wanted something that wasn't comparable. Uh, I wanted something that you wouldn't be able to tell was within the same world. And so we decided to do, instead of a theme song, to do score. Uh, and so that's what you hear in the trailer. I got you. yeah. I, I didn't know. I was afraid. I didn't want to overstep. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. No, I, I kind of been wanting to talk about that, that. That people don't realize how important that score is that they're hearing because they're going to be hearing it twelve or whatever different times, however many more times. That is the new theme song to the. Uh, so it does carry over. We have the same idea in a different format. Uh, you don't even realize you're listening to the same beats because it's not a hip hop song. It's a score. Right. It, it's a. It's I. I it's the I've same heard beats. And I and I love them both, and and it is a complete. It's all it's much bigger is is what maybe we talked about. Like it's it's because that is the parallel of the season. The season is something that is much bigger. The season is, and right. This, this is actually a good conversation for uh, Mr. Alex Payne, who's a wonderful musician himself. Wonderful musician. You guys got to look up Gatsby on YouTube. Uh, his shit's great. Uh, he's got a couple of uh, choice tracks out there. I don't know if he's got different representation representation for all of them, but uh, they're really good. You you get your hands on some, but yeah, scores scores for classic films. I tell you, there's um like I don't know one of, one of my favorites, and, and this was always I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Passion album by Peter Gabriel. It's the the score from the Last Temptation of Christ. That is I'm not the best album. Be, I'm not going to try and be online and act like I didn't know Peter Gabriel fucking did The Last Temptation of Christ. I had no fucking clue. 
It's I, I had no clue either, and and it's it's very like world music sounding. Martin but it's, Scorsese, but it's a, Willem Dafoe, I, Peter Gabriel. It's a sex album too. You put that thing on, and it it yeah, it takes you it takes you places. You go with the music, and it takes you places. That's crazy cool. Crazy cool. Uh, do you That's have a favorite cool. a favorite soundtrack or score? Or, oh, I know, oh, yeah, I know uh, you're big on you lists. Uh, I hate we were lists, talking about but... something like that earlier. Um, so yeah, I love soundtracks. That's a whole different conversation that I could go on and on about. But um, the best things that sound like soundtracks are a huge part of my life because the concept of soundtracks a, a soundtrack for a movie. So like for example, Forrest Gump is one of the top 10 biggest soundtracks ever made. However, every song on that soundtrack was not made for Forrest Gump. So I'm talking like a soundtrack where this, this artist came on board to make a new song for that movie specifically. Tell them about Spaghetti Westerns. What, um, what do you got there, Spaghetti Westerns? Yeah, Spaghetti Westerns is a, uh, is, a, is like, the, what was it? It's the response to, uh, uh, speak, what is it? Uh, uh, John Williams. What is the John joke? Williams is phenomenal. He, yeah, John Williams is king. John Williams is king. I mean, you know, I saw John Williams in concert, and that was epic. I saw. Have you seen John Williams in concert? I have. He does the Hollywood Bowl like once a year. Yeah. I need to do oh, it before he dies. It. That was. Yeah, I need to go do it. And Danny Elfman's going to be there the weekend of uh, of yeah. uh, Halloween. That's, I can't. He's king. I can't he's make king. that. To me, he's king. Uh, he's king as far as score goes, but um, soundtracks. I, I happen to know a lot about them, and the '90s is like the king of soundtracks. Really, '80s oh, did well. it good too. '80s did it good too with Ghostbusters and Back to the Future, but like '90s has Clerks, Pulp Fiction, uh, The Crow has you the, know, dude, the, the Crow is phenomenal. Um, yeah, The uh, Crow is you know, The Crow is one of my favorite movies of all time. But the soundtrack is probably shit, one of the was, best soundtracks ever made. What was the other movie? What was the one with Woody Harrelson and uh, White Man Came Down? <sighs> What is it? White Man Can't Jump? <laughs> no, no, no. The one with a really good soundtrack. Um, oh, shit. Uh, it'll come to me. But I was going to say, yeah, what, like, all the, all the John Hughes films in the 80s. Yeah, John, like, John Hughes really John Hughes they, really they had soundtracks iconic, in the 80s. Iconic music, you know, stuff that stuck with you that, you know, you hear a song and you, you, it takes you to a moment in high school. Yeah, well, that's Ghostbusters. Like that. It's not just the Ray Parker Jr. Natural theme that hits you. Is that it? Which one? Did Natural Born Killers have a killer soundtrack? Is that the one I'm thinking yeah, of? Yeah, but there, there's like five Woody Harrelson movies that had great soundtracks. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> what? Oh, give me a list. Uh, give me a list. About I like earlier, but if you stop and think about it, Batman, as well yeah. as The Crow, Batman and, and The Crow sequels, none of these movies or installments had a bad soundtrack. The worst movie had the best soundtrack. Batman and Robin is a fucking wretched movie. The soundtrack has Smashing Pumpkins, Bone Thugs and Harmony, R. Kelly, like the M Maloko. <laughs> it goes on. It Goo Goo Dolls. It goes on. It goes on. It goes on. It's fucking ridiculous, right? But Batman Forever. Alex says Batman best, Forever best is probably score. one of the best soundtracks ever made. Ever. Uh, Batman Forever is probably one of the best soundtracks ever made. On this soundtrack alone, U2, PJ Harvey, of course, Seal, Brandy, Offspring, Flaming Lips, Method Man. Wow. Like, boom, boom. The hits keep on. And they're all jams, too. They're jams. All of them are great. Sunny Day Real Estate's on there. Like, that's the best soundtrack probably ever made. Uh, the 90s birth, the, the 90s molded the soundtracks. You can't give them credit for birthing it because realistically, dan you know, Dirty Dancing, Back to the Future, uh, Ghostbusters, like, 80s really birthed the soundtrack. The soundtrack that's we not musical. Because if we want to give soundtracks credit, then we got to go all the way back to Greece. And now we're talking about musicals, and we're talking about a whole different genre. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a non-musical soundtrack, yeah, the 80s birthed it, the 90s molded it. For sure. We got, uh, uh, as far as score goes, bro, Danny Elfman, come on. There's just there's nobody else to talk about except Danny Elfman or John Williams. And when they're out of sync or people don't talk about them anymore, uh, um Michael Giacchino is fucking phenomenal. Uh, Basil, I don't know his last name, but he did Terminator. He did Robocop. He's fucking great. Uh, um, like, score. My, I mean, Graham Ravel, the Crow score. The score is beautiful because uh, it's essentially a love story, and only the score captures that and tells you that. 
I'm, Hans look, Zimmer, I'm looking Hans back. Hans Zimmer. Uh, um, James Horner. James, the late James, the late great James Horner was a genius. He did Willow. Uh, he did uh, Grease. He, he just he just mentioned Titanic, Grease. Yeah, I believe. I, I hope oh, this Titanic can suck my balls. Um, about that. <laughs> horror horror scores though. So, uh, they were saying like um, Halloween, but like uh, uh, Exorcist, maybe Exorcist. Yeah. As a horror, I mean, sport. John Carpenter came in there, and nobody talked about anything ever since. When it comes to when it comes to horror score, for some reason, horror score is interesting. Horror score is interesting. You know, again, I bring up Scream. Has it been ten minutes? Yeah, Scream. Uh, the the, <laughs> the, the uh, musical, uh, the musical composer they hired for Scream, never seen a horror movie because he was too scared of horror. So they, if you listen to Scream, it sounds more like a western. Score wise, uh, it's got like a solo, like guitar boom, boom. Like it's, it sounds like a western. It's really weird because the guy didn't approach it like a horror movie. The Babe with the Power. Oh Jesus, yeah, Labyrinth. Um, I, love it. Love it. I just introduced my son to Labyrinth, by the way. I, something I was going to ask you is, what do you think? I, I'm getting, you know, dude. Where we may go over an hour because I've, I've, I've Have I we had not gone over an hour yet. I had, well, we we haven't this yet. This is going to be we're, a we're long over, night. Jesus Christ! We're, we're over a half hour, and and I haven't even what? touched on the person. Uh, I, I haven't there. even touched on the personal, all the personal stuff I wanted to get to. Um, th but the thing is, there there are some other important things I wanted I wanted to sort of like touch on, and sort of you know skip on. You know, I wanted to ask you stuff like, what's your favorite cinematic universe, or what drew you into acting, or uh, stuff like that. But we're we're the we're, cinematic we're running universe out of is time. interesting. And I'll be I'll be real swift about this because. There are cinematic universes you're not aware exist. And uh, <laughs> if you find out that they exist, all of a sudden it changes, right? So let me blow your mind. Do you know that Willow, there's a possibility that Willow exists in Star Wars? It's the same universe. Now, I know EP I does. actually talked to Ron Howard myself during a Willow, like, sell it like uh, whatever, one of those 25th anniversary things. Met Ron Howard, talked to him about it. Ron Howard himself, out of his own, I actually have it on video. Says I don't. He says I don't know what the you know the fuck you're talking about. It's essentially he he. But but again, he's not George Lucas. He wouldn't know. Um, also, didn't we all just recently watch the Scream movies? Did nobody else see Jay and Silent Bob pop up in Scream Three? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know what's interesting about this? You watch Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. There's a sequence where Jay and Silent Bob accidentally storm Scream Five. And Wes Craven's in the scene. Oh wow! So I love, it, I love when if you, you think about it like, like that, that, then it actually doesn't make sense. Because why would Wes Craven? Like, are they in the movie? But that's what Scream's about. If you think about that, like that, then those are probably over something like. I mean, the obvious answer would be Tarantino. This is the obvious answer. Tarantino has such an in-depth connection to all his characters. Oh, stuff like from all like his movies are all his movies are connected by two separate whatever. worlds. In fact, uh, right there's the the fake movie world that his characters watch it on, and there's the real world that his characters are based in. So, like Kill Bill is a fake movie that the characters in Pulp Fiction watched because Uma Thurman starred in the hit show that was about five assassins or whatever, and that's the show that's Kill Bill, essentially. So that gets in depth, but I don't count things like Marvel. Because the Marvel has existed before it was on film, that is sure. not a cinematic universe. That is Marvel's universe. Well, They're they have they have created a cinematic universe. So, something I like about Marvel Fox is Force I five. like Marvel's, yeah, Fox Force Five. Thank you, Meg. I do like I do like Marvel's consistency, uh, as opposed to like DC, which is all over the place with their cinematic universe is different from their TV universe, which is different from their animated universe. Well, really, only have, only one of them is. Only one cinematic universe has done that well, which is Marvel, because they were able to plan ahead. Star, Star Wars is double backing on the information they already had for like 10, 20 years and telling us, hey, here's Boba Fett, here's Boba Fett, here's Boba Fett, here's all you want to know about him. It's been fucking 20 years. I just fucking love the guy. I don't need to know anything more about him. Like, you don't need to double But back. here's the Mandalorian. You're building out new characters with the Mandalorian. You're building yeah, out I new like characters. Yeah, I like to do with Mandalorian because with if there Andor, is a nostalgic character, he's basically walking past the story. He's not a part of the story. There's a great book 
there's a couple great books. Um, I've got it sitting here under a pile of stuff uh, called from, I don't know if you, I, I unfortunately don't read as much as I ought to, but it's called from a certain point of view and they've released one for star Wars and they've released one for empire strikes back. And I think, for the 30th or four, what is it, 40th anniversary will be coming up. They'll release it for Empire, for Return of the Jedi. What it is, it's a collection of short stories. Uh, Apple cigarette brand Tarantino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's a collection of short stories told from a certain point of view. And what they do is they take sub characters from the movies and they tell a little short story from that character's perspective. Like in Empire Strikes Back, I got bulls. Are, are you still with me? Hey, buddy. Yeah, I got you. So they're yeah. sending out those drones to find all the rebels, right? And the, there's a short story in there about uh, an Imperial officer whose job it is to watch the video footage of the drones. And she's the one that actually first sees the rebels on Hoth, and she tries to cover it up. It, one, of, one of them is from the perspective of one of the Tauntauns. One of them is from the careful We gotta be careful about having a fucking. We gotta be careful having a Star Wars conversation in the middle of a fucking show about film buff. Are you fucking kidding me? Like I'm sitting here listening to you, and I just realized that I should be set up just talking to you. I'm set up, and the whole world's watching us talk about fucking Star Wars. <laughs> How did it feel having the cast two days? This is something that is not really known. We shot in two different locations for the show season two, and that was California and Las Vegas. Vegas was a pain in my fucking asshole, man, to be honest with you. Like, it was a pain in the ass, bro. Like, and I... Why? I love the, I love the cast and crew, so I love seeing them. But the two the cities treat the location the locations two different ways. Um, okay, yeah, you said you want to focus a little more on, on, on the show. We, we can... We can Pull it, away, pull it away from you and some of the other questions I have. Um, no, so you talk about whatever you want, yeah. but I know you, didn't, I know you didn't have four questions about Star Wars in there. <laughs> no, just this book is dope. I think everybody should read this book. Um, You're promoting I do wanna, books you know what? on a show about hour. film buffs. It's, been, it's, been, it's, it's that good of a book. 45 minutes. I, I do want to say uh, the, the reason we're here is the Kickstarter campaign. So anybody who's uh, still with us and anybody who's watching, there are links on, on Will's page, on the Film Buff page, on my page, on my Instagram, on my Facebook, and my stories, Basically, and my go reels. To, go to Kickstarter and look up Film Buff Part 2. And and help help us out. We have about seven days left in the campaign. And um, you could help, help throw Strauss. some stuff in so that we can do some more stuff. Like, uh, like okay, from season one. I, I was going to ask you if you had things that you collected or any collections. I know one of them is movie posters, and that's what kind of drew drew the love to Drew. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, the Drew story, how I got Drew is amazing, but I do have poster collections if that's what you're getting to. Well, the the poster collections was to get me in <laughs> to get me into about Drew, about people like uh, what you had David, who who's a David won an Oscar. You know, you got yeah. you got to. You got a freaking Oscar winner on the show. Um, yeah. And these, these are both guys that were from the from the cinema chat part from season one, which is, again, yeah. one of the things I love, the way you took, you know, this and you incorporated this into it. But you had, there were six shows for a season. There were five cinema chats. Yeah. Um, am am so I wrong? There is, there's six episodes, there's five cinema chats, which means that, yes, there is a story there. And not only is there a story there, but... Uh, how do I say this? Season two plays off the um, misfortunes we have for season one. And um, and the, the misfortunes that we had in season one actually create a plot that forms into a storytelling like overfabrication, if that makes sense. So we do have a cinema chat missing. That's so. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. You had you you have you have people you brought in for all these. What? Yeah, is, we is, there, have, is there? We have a, is we that had a list is of that people we, we tried out in season two. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the actual answer. Be, we don't. I can tell you right now what the actual answer is, but I can't tell you what the answer we're going to use in the new show is going to be. Right on. Um, and the answer is, 
the real answer is is that uh, we thought we had somebody, and it was actually really good. And up until the last minute, we had to shoot. I think a couple of days before, uh, it didn't go through. Got canceled, and uh, became one of the yeah. saddest one of the saddest things. I couldn't get up. Uh, if I had gotten this, it would have been as equally magical as getting the DeLorean. So who what, who didn't make the cut, or what didn't how, what didn't work out? Would you believe? For any fans of Ron Howard, George Lucas, or Willow, would you believe that I almost got the Brownies reunion? I almost got Kevin Pollock, and I almost got uh, what's the, uh, Rick Rick Overton, I think his name is, a genius comedian. The two the two Brownies, the two small people. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you, how, do you not remember Willow? How, how old how old are we? No, I, I, I'm well, so no old. Movie. I don't... I'm just, I'm just wondering because they're about to come out uh, the new show on Disney. So no, they got a new show. What I was going to say is, I'm so old. Gotta... I don't remember things anymore. And but this, you know, the little miniature like people. But no, no, no. I know what you're talking about. Brownies, fairies, the little fairies. Yeah, so little... exactly. So Kevin Pollock was one of the brownies. Uh, he that was one of the first things he did. Um, I almost got them because I knew them amazing. on separate. I knew, I knew them on separate. Th I, I was all about it, bro. I was. I don't even know what I was going to ask him. I don't even know what I'm going to ask him. What am I going to ask him? <laughs> like, what the fuck am I going to ask him about Willow that I don't already fucking know? Right, number one. Uh, number two, like, I just sit there, sit there and let them talk for 10 minutes, and that's cinema chat to me. Like, that was the best. But uh, Kevin Pollock was actually finishing his podcast. Uh, he was not available. Not available. There was, so. there was, you had some other people, some other people that couldn't make it. They were doing other things. You want to, you want to drop uh, yeah, another well, name? So or? Here's a, here's <laughs> an, ex, here's an exclusive debut. Um, here's an exclusive debut. Uh, so we did reach out to a lot of people. We were talking about lot, music. Uh, yeah. Well, we reached out to a lot of people about different subjects. Of course, cinema chat is full of different subjects in film. And one of the ones that we kept, uh, one of the okay, so we kept reaching out to people. We don't know if they received, you know, they they only had a certain amount of time to respond. Some of the more impressive names that we reached out, and and one that actually responded was Mr. Danny Elfman. That's the one. That's uh, the one. That was that was uh, just to be turned down. You know, <laughs> it's an honor. What, but he was what, he was really sweet about it. Uh, he was he just wasn't in he was he was in the country basically touring Europe or something. Yeah, right? he was touring. Yeah, uh, uh, I did reach out to uh, Mr. Kevin Smith. Uh, I don't know that he received yeah. anything. So I'm I'm telling people that I, I I I'm telling people that this was like my wish list of people, right? And the Drew Struzan thing's actually funny because the how I got him was I was looking for like. Somebody who who he had trained, basically his padwan or whatever, and I met a guy who had trained under him, and so I wanted to get this guy on my show to interview him about Drew Struzan. That was how this whole thing started, and like I was like, oh, I, I, if I could just get you to come on, tell me how he is, and tell me who, he, like, uh, it'd be the greatest thing ever because that's how that's how much I love the guy, right? This this angel of a human being. Uh, first of all, of course, this guy is married to his high school sweetheart. You know what I mean? He, he's just, he's that cool. And of course, he's just the coolest wife in the world. And it was her that answered the call and responded. Because I was like, well, if I have this guy, let me just see if I can get you. Whatever. And uh, she responded. And they were so cool. This is, let me tell you, bro, the posters that he signed had been on my wall since I was 10 or 9 years old, right? And so that was the collection signed, thing, yeah. This, this day that he's signing my posters, plus, by the way, nobody knows this, but all the cinema chats were filmed in one day. So it wasn't just Drew Struzan who was there. Like, everybody was there that day. I'm, wow. sitting, there with, I'm sitting there with Drew Struzan before we film, right? And I'm talking to him one-on-one -on -one just to, like, clear the air. I'm talking... I might have idols in the, in the loose sense of the word 10, 15, and he's definitely one of them. And he's sitting here talking to me about... He's giving me parenting advice because I've just become a father. Isn't that amazing? He's giving me parenting advice, and he's telling me about his old days with Jim Henson because he did all the Muppet posters. I'm like, dude, wow. you're the coolest guy in the world. 
Yeah, he did all the Muppet. He did the Muppet movie poster. He did the Muppets Take Manhattan poster. He did the Great Muppet Caper poster. He did the Muppets Treasure Island poster. He did all of them. Like the guys, he did That's Police Academy. He did all the Police Academy posts. He did Harry Potter posts. Like, I, I can go on and on and on. Anyways, so that was that was just that, that was, was a great that was amazing. I know there were other people. Like, I definitely am one of those shoot for the stars kind of guy. Uh, sure. It has definitely accidentally worked in my favor more than not. Well, we're. I was. I, there's another thing I was gonna wait till later, but you just you just kind of said shoot for the stars, and time's getting long here. I, I just want to drop a name. Keanu Reeves. Mm. Uh, we have a ongoing. It was ongoing thing about Keanu Reeves. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that somebody asked me now because at the time that K Day, which is the sketch that appears in season two, was written and conceived, Keanu Reeves had not been a part of the Keanu Sons, is what they refer to it as. Right? This happened at John Wick three, not one or two, but part three. John Wick 3 comes out, and it's huge. And this keanu sans is what it's called happens, right? That's where Bill and Ted come. That's where the new Bill and Ted comes from, the new Matrix comes from, the new Constantine. They all come from this. But I had a really close friend of mine that I, who I absolutely love and adore named Tyler Tackett. Really great artist. Really great writer. Really great actor. He's, you guys got to look up his work. He, he and I were just hanging around my place. Like, this was years, maybe, I don't know, nine years ago, something like We were just smoking weed. At my place just <laughs> hanging out We're just hanging out every fucking time we hang out we fucking talk about john wick three or we talk about we talk about john wick three we talk about keanu reeves we, we're always talking about and gushing about keanu reeves and my overall personification about keanu reeves and why people are obsessed with him is because he's the only actor who has successfully reinvented himself about every five years of his career so the keanu reeves we have right now is not the Bill and Ted Keanu Reeves that you and I grew up with. The Bill and Ted Keanu Reeves that you and I grew up with is my own private Idaho Keanu Reeves. He is, he is Bill and Ted Keanu Reeves. He's point break Keanu Reeves, right? Wow. He has, they're, yeah, almost yeah. The same, they're almost the same character, even. And to people, this is who Keanu Reeves was, Parenthood. The Keanu Reeves character in Parenthood is who people thought Keanu Reeves was. And oh, then, my God, that's right. And then four or five years later, he comes out with Speed. And people don't know this, but 1994, very influential year in film, Speed, Keanu Reeves created the buzz cut craze in the middle of the 90s people guys start getting buzz cuts it's just so they, you know not doing anything with their head that was keanu reeves that fucking did that of course of course so, you know it brings back dennis hopper it makes sandra bullock a star of keanu reeves keanu reeves right nobody would know but four years later or so this same actor would become the luke skywalker slash jesus christ figure in a new like science fiction like explosion the matrix neo is huge for the 90s huge for the 90s and neo is nowhere the same as johnny utah is nowhere the same as jack tavern and speed they're not the same character this is a guy who has clearly learned and become humble from knowing that he can become better as a performer and as an actor and in doing so has recreated himself every four years we're not talking about he's done Sh shakespeare babes in toyland huh? Devil's Advocate, like, like they're all, yeah, Babes in Toilet. I've seen Babes in Toilet. I love that fucking movie. But, like, then we think he's done because the Matrix sequels come out and kind of bomb low-key. But then five years later, we get fucking John Wick. And we get yeah. John Wick because of the result of the Matrix. Do you know that the stunt coordinator for the Matrix directed John Wick? So it's all the stunt people from the Matrix. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, like... So, like, here's a guy who's done it four or five times already, and we still are obsessed the guy's 60 years old, sweet Cosmic as fucking thing. candy. And so, yeah, if you notice, K-Day does not have any jokes against Keanu Reeves. They're all in favor of Keanu. They all heighten the love that the world has and fascination that they have for Keanu Reeves, rightfully so. Well, I uh, say Keanu, we get, him, we get him in on season two or something. We, if anybody, <laughs> we, let's, put that, let's put that energy out in the universe. He, he no. was in that movie, uh, The Bad Batch, that I just saw, the one that we were talking mm -hmm. about with Jim Carrey earlier. And again, he plays these small, quirky little roles. Sometimes it was, it was phenomenal. It was, I don't know. If he was a rapper, he'd be I, the goat. Race of all time. I dig, the, I dig the hell out of him. He's a, and he's and you said he's a hell of a nice guy too. That's yeah. That's so we sure. we decided to sit. There was actually a segment on the encore selection of Film Buff about that sketch in particular, which accounts all the references that we make to Keanu Reeves. 
down to our characters' names. Every character's name in the K-Day sketch is a character from that Keanu Reeves has played in a movie or so. And now that's that's a way that um, – because there, there was such a gap there's been a gap, you know, between season one and season two. And we've seen a lot of that happen lately because of the pandemic with a lot of shows. There's a lot of stuff out there that, you know, production got shut down or this or that for, for one reason or another. And that's certainly a, um, a hurdle that, that you've been able to leap with this show. Uh, not, not only, not only leap the hurdle, but retain a high number of, of like people that were involved in season one that have stuck around to be involved in season two, people that did things, whether as, as directors or the actors and stuff and people that you don't have contracts with, you don't have, you know, there's no, there's no forced obligation on their part yet. Yeah, you have to build if... these relationships and, and, and develop these, these, I don't know. You... Yeah. The, 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 do it. That's another thing about, <laughs> That was another crazy thing about film buff that was separate from being contracted was without that connection, without any of that legal binding, the people who are part of the show did it because they loved the tribute or they loved the honor of it, I guess, in a way. Um, there's a lot of things about the people, everybody, there's always a giant story about every person I've asked to be a part of it and for what reason. Um, and it's interesting that season two is completely different, but season one, a, a good uh, IMDb listed about like seven, 72 people casting crew, uh, all who did it because they were people I knew and loved and wanted uh, to be a part of. Um, I knew where people's certain strengths were, and I knew where people had kind of desired to be a part of again. And so I would assign certain sketches to friends that I know wanted to direct again one, one day. Or I, I filmed a, or I, I wrote a two, three minute scene where somebody walks through, says something really funny, and then walks out. But like, I always tried to figure out a way to include people that I always, you know, when you are around LA or Hollywood, you kind of always leave the room with, I'll work with you one day, kind of like attitude, like, you know, you're going to see them one day. Film Buff was the, the means to that end. And in doing that, uh, season two becomes, you know, as season one ends and explains really, it becomes a much more personal idea. And season two, of course, at a, such a giant risk, uh, put me in a situation where I asked people I've always wanted to work with to be a part of it. And more importantly, I've used it as a way to reconcile uh, a certain um, friendships that had ended. Uh, and I wanted to kind of use the show as healing, as a healing uh, factor. So there are people, there are a lot of... There's a lot of surprises in season two. A lot of fucking surprises in season two, uh, personally and uh, creatively. Well, it it is it is very personal. There's um, you know, people talk about how even season one was, was conceived. Um, whether it was something that you know came from uh, you you worked on a show Murph and Burn. And oh, yeah. then if, if it was, if it was something, this is maybe something like what you were just even talking about, that maybe something from the fallout from that, or, or, or maybe it had something to do with finding out, you know, you were going to be a dad, you know, this was another um, big, a big changing a point in your life, or, or maybe it was tied into being at second city and, and knowing people, from, there's like so many things where is, was it, is it an amalgam of all of that or, or? so, um, you know, there, Clerks is a great movie, but the story of how Clerks got made is better. Swingers is a good movie, but the story of how Swingers got made is better. Um, Film Buff, I'm very proud of it, but how I got it constructed was a beast and a much more difficult uh, uh, endeavor than I, I took, than I thought I would be taken on. However, there's a lot of things that benefited me from, at the, from doing that show, and one of those things was the timing. Yes, everything you're saying is correct in a sense because Film Buff is in the dead center of all these important moments in my life, but it really all stemmed from uh, the loss of a parent. And anybody who's lost a parent or anybody who knows that, if you ever heard that term, I would never wish that on my worst enemy, that's what they were uh, talking about. They were talking about losing a parent. It's um, a game changer. That's a game it's changer. It's a game changer, right? So at the time that this is happening, yes, I start – my relationship with Second City Improv, which I never thought of myself 
as a comedian in, in, in a sense because I love them and I respect them. But uh, no, you can't have that, Willie. Come on, Jesus fucking Christ! You're gonna use the only time you talk to ask me if you can have something in the room. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, uh, so losing my mother started Second City. My relationship with Second City showed that I was really good at something I didn't necessarily care to be good at, which was comedy. I didn't care not to be good at it, but like I just had so much love and respect for it that I happened to be pretty good at it. But you graduate Second City in Hollywood, and there's, there's not much to do. I just didn't think I could do comedy. I wanted to do film. So if I did comedy, I wanted to merge it with film. You know what I mean? And so then I find out I'm going to be a dad. Yeah. I find out I'm going to be a dad with, uh, essentially, with my best friend. And this was a redefining moment for me because um, even my... Uh, my uh, childhood growing up, uh, I was, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, I was adopted. Uh, and that is a whole game changer as well as far as how you feel about, you know, how you have a child or if you have a child. Because that's, that's I got to grow up in a home where I saw kids leave and I didn't have to leave. So becoming a father, you don't have a choice of abandoning that child. Like that child is, and not that I had that choice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that um, I, I don't know. I guess essentially, I I did feel there was this clock that was like, you better show them that you're not full of shit. And I had a degree in comedy, and so I'm thinking to myself, well, what can I do? We had a fallout from Murph and Burn that I won't really go into because we've reconciled and and we're really proud of the work we've done together. Um, and he's, they're all doing great, by the way. Real and Seal's doing fantastic. You know, as you know, Ryan is my co-host for Film Buff. But um, the fallout from that made me realize that if I have a cast that helps me build a story for five or six years, and then they abandon that story, I can't fucking sleep at night. Like, I can't fucking do anything because I've invested my time in telling people a story I believed in and didn't get to finish. Whether it was a good story or not, that story has to finish. And so, uh, yeah, Film Buff became the idea of, well, I could tell a story for 10 minutes, and if that cast walks out, that's fine, I lost 10 minutes. So they're a series of short stories, not sketches to me. And, and some of those short stories, well, they-, they, like, they like this one back here. Carry over definitely. and become something bigger. Yeah, sometimes they become beasts, for sure. Uh, I just, I want to throw back real quick because I saw it. Uh, Alex said, if you could have Kendrick Lamar or Drake place a song in Film Buff 2, how quickly would it take for you to pick a little Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was pretty funny and worth sharing. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, investing time, money, and energy in the story. Uh, I feel so many people do not get to that. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. To the, to end the story, so I, 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 you know, I got to work with you a little bit in in, in Murph and Burn, and, and yeah, I, we get you. Uh, we got my you. Son, my son was in one of them. Thank you. You put my son in. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> your your boys are they're beautiful. Yeah, we're, they're, they're great. They we're both too. dads. You know, it's it's that's a that's a that's a lifelong thing. That's a, um, you know, um. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at the time, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" Uh, like, oh, what, what's what's on in the back? Oh, is that the dude? That is out of control. That's that saying that. Yes. <laughs> you you want to talk about that? Rascals, that was, dude. It's so you know. Do you think? When did you do that? When did you film that? How long ago? How long ago? Uh, March 2019. Do you think you could drop that today? I with didn't the, think I'd drop it the, then. I didn't the think I could drop it then. Cancel culture with the, like because that's I thought I do. I thought this sketch was going to ruin me. And in all honesty, the original draft was really bad. Yeah, there were no Star. like. Huh? Sorry, I saw somebody who jumped in. Um, it's but it's it, it's. I'm all for look. I am Mister. 
cross the line. I am Mr. Yeah. Take it too far. People know that about me. I used to, when I worked behind the bar, people that worked with me used to have to apologize for me constantly to the guests because I'm the guy that's going to just take it too far. I'm like, that sketch, if there's a line, that sketch lives on the other side of the line. Dude, yeah, it lives lives way far on the other opposite ends of the tracks. I, I so... I wrote, I, so, and if you notice, by comparison, it is especially out of their way dirty. Like, I did it so they could have one. Yeah. So I could have one. Now, here's why it works, and here's why I even did it, is because, and it's, it's essentially the reason why I love Dumb and Dumber. It's a shout, and shout, shout out to Dumb and Dumber. Uh, Dumb and Dumber works because these guys, it's not because these guys are so stupid. It's because everybody else is not so stupid. So... In this sketch, the wives make it work. It's the performances of Amber Wagner and Kate Rappaport, uh, who are great, and their reaction. To, that's what makes the sketch work. If everybody in the scene was like that, you have wouldn't work. Work. Wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. work. Yeah. So uh, that's why I got away with that. Um, going, you know, uh, genius directing of Dane Bowling and editing of Dane Bowling, by the way. Well, I, that, that's something else I, I didn't get to touch on yet either. Uh, you know, like I said, not only do you have an extensive list of people working like uh, in front of the camera, but behind the camera, you know, you, you're it's the show's an amalgam. The show's a it, you, you've worked with other other directors, other people doing stuff. Was there? Um, I don't know who who I don't want to. I don't. Know, I hate to say stuff, but who was your favorite, or maybe which ones? came out the best or, or uh, there was no there was uh, nobody I, I didn't work with enough of them really there was nobody who was the worst they were all fantastic in their own field and for what they did and I mean, you take that that same Ryan, Ryan, directed, two? Ryan directed two of them uh, Ryan directed two of them but I will tell you for a fact that Kelly Hallmark uh, name drop in particular pulled off an impossible Kelly Hallmark came in and saved my show because Kelly Hallmark is the only director that directed more than one sketch. Besides Ryan, by the way. Ryan himself directed two. But Kelly Hallmark is responsible for every time you see Anxiety on screen. Anxiety the Clown was directed by Kelly Hallmark. And it was written by me and actress Amanda Gavin. Um, uh, between the three of us, we created Anxiety. Uh, Kelly Hallmark is a gift to the show. Like, she... She is, and I hope she hears it. She's the, she, she was the goat. She was the goat, for sure. <laughs> She's the best. She's the most beautiful woman. She's great. Um, I'm looking over my oh, notes. I will, I, say, sure I, will say, Brian, I, I will say our star director, like our celebrity director, Brian Lugo, comes in. He did K-Day. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, did Brian direct K-Day? Brian Lugo directed K-Day. Yeah, his wife's in it. His wife's in it. Wow. I love Brian. Which, I, was really, I was really excited to get Lugo. I was thrilled that his wife did a cameo. <laughs> like, I was like, well, just to have them both, actually, like, I love Brian Lugo. Uh, William Van Chuck. Van Chuck? Van Kuyk. Uh, came and did the uh, James Bond sketch. Did he? That's... Uh, that's that's him, and it's the great acting of uh, Slim Curtsy, I believe, if I'm I saying the name right. right. The guy who, um, the torturer, Far Far Fal Fal Far Bishna, something like that. Uh, genius. This guy is like Charlie Chaplin. Good. Uh, he would have he would have been he would have been great as a 1920s 30s like silent actor, and that's who we got essentially. That's something you don't realize is that's what, that's the honor of that's the that's what we're trying to honor almost. It's not just the James Bond sketches or I thought to myself the sequences where the director or no not director the villain walks around the hero who's tied up and tells him his plan. I was making fun of that. I love those <laughs> scenes and that's what I was making fun of. <laughs> love those scenes. Love them. Now, now are you are you taking the like <laughs> we have we haven't discussed a lot about uh moving in to season to the season two um because it is there's there's a a metamorphosis there's a change there's a you know you know what i mean like i don't oh, know i want to make sure um you know you season one 
we, we've talked about it. Sketch comedy, the interviews, the, the Tinseltown trivia. You know, um, what, what? Tinseltown trivia was the only idea that kind of I lost control over. And it's not that I don't think it worked. It's that I didn't have time to construct it uh, properly. And so um, Tinseltown trivia was written for somebody in particular who couldn't do it at the last minute. And then the person who did take over was great, but she, she thought it was something different than what we thought. And so the outcome didn't turn out necessarily the way either one of us wanted to because we weren't really on the same page. Uh, it's not so much to say that it's ruined, but the trailer sh explains that there is a new Tinseltown trivia. Uh, oh, yeah, where's it? Where is it going? What's that? That's yeah. That's, okay. uh, so the the idea of it, and it's always it's kind of always been the idea. Uh, for me, Tinseltown trivia to me was like the equivalent of a James Bond girl. Um, you get a different James Bond girl every movie. It's not that they they all have their different reasons why they're not in the next one. Like. They're all strong in their own way. We don't downplay them. And I don't use the question and answer uh, segment to um, kind of rotate women in a way, if that makes sense. That wasn't the idea. But I wanted a different damsel, if that makes sense. I wanted a different era of, of a female film icon. So Bernadette Harlow was my season one's icon. And season two, we have a different... Uh, uh, like iconic look for for her, and a different reason. You know, I say that the show itself is a now a uh, consistent storyline show. We do have an explanation and a reason as to why that has changed. Yeah, and that's the other thing, piggybacking off the last, you know, sort of the last sketch from the first season. Is that what's up right now? No, that's, yes, that's me uh, as a clown stripping. Oh, that's the. Yeah. Hey, Let me tell you something. I really those all four of my really really close friends. Actually, five of those all five of my close friends. I definitely traumatized them that night. Like, that's one of those things that you don't like. <laughs> that's one of those things that five years down the road, if you say it out loud, you're like, I. There's three crazy things that happened in that one sentence. <laughs> uh, a clown stripping. Uh, that my friend has a clown strip. Yeah, no, I. I it, <laughs> That's one of those things where I'm writing it, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. Like, it was funny when I wrote it, but standing up there, I'm terrified. I'm terrified, and I can't tell you how horrible those outtakes are. That'd be, that'd be great to see. Did you, now, did you ever put – you did, but between – in the gap between the seasons, you took – you know, to, to keep things sort of relevant or keep things out there, you took things – you did the, the uh, film buff Encore – uh, where you just took all the sketches and then you you sort of stretched them. You sort of like you took was some of it outtakes, is some of it commentary. Yeah, is, so is like, I'm really proud of the encore, but I don't necessarily know that people really not necessarily didn't understand what I was doing. I don't know if I promoted it right. So I think upon coming out with encore, people thought that I was doing a continuation of the show with with uh, new stories but what encore is is basically if you bought a dvd and you just watched the special features of that dvd encore is the longer cuts better cuts different uh points of view of um i mean i think we have 22 some sketches and out of 22 sketches 20 of them have an encore presentation either a longer like a version cut. yeah a director's cut essentially um and I could be wrong. It could be. It could be actually more than more than. But anyways, a lot of them did. And we're talking like some of them are a couple of clips more, but they mean a lot to us. And some of them, like the James Bond one, I don't know if you noticed, is the biggest has the most significant change, which is it goes from a six minute sketch to like a twelve minutes or eleven minutes. It's crazy. Wow. For a reason, it's supposed to be excruciatingly painful, like the guy who's being tortured. Like that was the idea. And so you feel it, but that's the point. That's why it's funny. Or, we, or I hope. And, and then Film Buff University is just... Mm. I think this, I mean, you're, this is maybe something like what I, now moving forward, we're doing this tonight, we're doing this live, and, and tonight this is more of a, 
this is supposed to be like an interview. It's supposed to be a pick your brain. It's supposed to be a talk a little bit about film buff. It's supposed to be mentioned once again at an hour and 15 minutes into it. There is a Kickstarter. There's uh, a Kickstarter campaign to finish season two. Do go to the Kickstarter campaign. Look up um, thoughts on Black Adam. Uh, you can touch on that. Uh, uh, but look on the Kickstarter. Uh, look up Film Buff Season 2 and uh, help us in our last week push it across the finish line. Um, but, yeah, Film Buff University was – you're going to start doing a uh, – you're going to start doing a – a, a live, uh, uh, like, a, like, uh, are you gonna try and do a weekly live, like a film buff sort of a live, wait, wait. live? Uh, let there. Okay, so the, se the segments we have for s film buff, film buff is essentially season one. It's an assortment of ideas that encase that contains cinema chat and Tinseltown trivia. After season one, we continued on with what is f film buff university, and our film buff encore, which is the extension right. and director's cuts and commentary tracks uh, and behind the scenes of season one. And it delves into university and university I constructed to keep the show going during the pandemic. So you see me sitting in an audience with myself because I only had a green screen. I couldn't go outside my room. I wasn't allowed to. So right. I taught myself how to edit. I taught myself how to do green screen. University became a result of that while I wrote season two. And university is essentially what I loved about Siskel and Ebert, which is the, the hardcore dissection of a movie. Uh, university focuses more on older titles or titles that I loved and grew up with. But then we come into, I believe right now, Facebook Live, uh, uh, which is our next step as we are trying to promote and finish season two with two more segments before that even. After this, we're going to go to film of commentary, I hope, anyways, where I actually am able to play a movie while I talk about it for two hours or whatever the movie is. Okay. And then, um, gosh, what was the one? There was, was one that Ryan, there was one that Ryan and I thought of where we toyed around with the idea of an actor coming out and doing a one-man play for their favorite movie. And so we were going to have Andy Dubitsky start with the first one and do his one-man play of Empire Strikes Back. And, like, we, th we thought that was genius. Who wouldn't pay to see that, dude? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that, that's, that's a great idea, right? So I don't know if we'll do that or not, but essentially Film Buff 2 is the cream of the crop. It's the – if a roller coaster was going up, Film of Part Two is the top of that roller coaster before it spirals down towards its towards its end or whatever. So, Film of Two right now is the big goal. Uh, somebody said here. Uh, let me try to go back. Uh, well, there was thoughts on Black Adam, but then somebody else wanted to know what they always ask you: What's the best movie you've seen this year? Okay. You want to touch on that? Yes, uh, I love talking about this movie. I have it right here because I I sleep with it at night. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Fucking gold. I'm still see that. God damn it. Fucking right. gold, bro. Listen, it, this movie made me fall in love with film all over again. All over again. This movie is, and it stars, you know, the kid from uh, uh, Temple of Doom. Short and Yeah. Yeah, short run. That's no mistake. Like, this movie feels like what you love, what you fell in love with, with film in the 80s. No matter what age you were, there was a magic in the 80s. Um, and it, some of it might have carried on to the 90s and lost its place somewhere down the line. I don't know. But, but this movie definitely brings it back. Uh, we're talking like the first science fiction movie in a long time to probably get a shitload of nominations. Uh, great movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to fucking see it. No, I, I need to. We've talked. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes here. We, we, that's, I keep. I, I got to see that. I got to see that. That's one I'm, that, that I meant to see in theaters, and I missed it in theaters. And so now, being the cheap bastard I am, I'm just kind of waiting for it to come around on the streaming service that I can watch. I'm a little bit biased because I'm a, such a Baz Luhrmann, like, nut, but Elvis was fucking great. 
I, I, guess, was I gotta great. watch that one too. I've heard good things about that. I love uh, Moulin Rouge. So yeah, and I love Moulin. I don't like musicals as much as I love Moulin Rouge. I love I, yeah. Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge is phenomenal, and he did uh, the Romeo and Juliet too, right? Yeah, that was again, the one, one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I love Romeo. What Juliet. a what a killer telling of that story. You know what I mean? Like uh, that. By the way, is my favorite soundtrack of all time. Romeo and Juliet, best soundtrack ever fucking made. There we go. That's awesome, Heather. How you yeah. doing? Um, that's super dope. Yeah, that's I. Um, I uh, got. I got to revisit that. Um, all right, so we we kind of hit on all the stuff. I could I could get uh, more personal. I was going to ask you about. Yeah, they asked you about your favorite movies. Do you do a lot of like somebody? Somebody asked me something the other night. I was messing around, and they had posted something on Instagram, and, and they they were asking like, "Oh, uh, this or that, this or that." You know, uh, left hand or right hand. Or, you know, which I'm like, whichever Did one. Somebody asked me. Where, left hand, uh, right hand? Uh, well, you know, go ahead. Uh, that wasn't it, but you know. Oh, man, I, I mean, it's clearly you right. I want, to be, I want to think outside the box and say left, but then there's going to be all kinds of newspaper articles that are false and fabricated, and I don't want that. Right? Yeah, keep it true. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, they, so one of the things they asked was, do you, what do you like more, film or like a serial, like a, like a series? Because now um, with, with, with streaming and stuff, there's so much out there in streaming. And we talked about, like, I talked about your favorite, uh, you know, your favorite cinematic universe. I don't, I don't know if you, if you touched on to what the, the, you, you did mention. There's a lot more than we know about, but you got Lord of the Rings building out now. You've got Star Wars building out now. You've got, uh, you know, all the R.R. Martin Game of Thrones stuff building out. But a lot of these are being done not through through the film medium, which they would have traditionally been done in the past, but through streaming where you have this opportunity yeah, so, to and tell essentially a longer that's, story. That's essentially kind of the idea of film buff in general, the collision of it. However, th this is good and bad to me uh, um, because, again, I'm such a loyalist to the cinematic experience. Um, right. That Can you have this? the cinematic experience like the budgets and the stuff on some of these and the story in some of these and the ability to develop the characters and the, and the storylines, can you have that same experience? I mean, you don't have the physical experience, obviously, of going to the cinema and getting your popcorn and your, your drink yeah, and sitting down um, and being there with a group of people. You're home alone on the couch. But So uh, I'm such a loyalist to cinema that, that television is kind of hurting that idea. Now, it's bad enough that we're fighting film to stop – crossing over to streaming but we have great storytelling in television now like great storytelling in television that we can't play in theaters so we had a problem before the pandemic the pandemic was this television was catching up uh really fast too like and sopranos was really the first to kind of do that hbo in general was really the first to kind of do that but like it's a problem i have because i i do love it and and I did I was around for these show, Breaking Bad, Sopranos, the anti-hero uh, yeah. moment. Love you too, Heather. <laughs> Love you, Heather. But um, but the television storytelling has gotten so good that um, that you only have time to really spend on one or the other. And so I have dedicated my time really to film, no matter how great of a show there is. And I know there's great shows. I know it. Like I'm not dissing shows i'm saying that there's shows well, so film buff is now. a show film bus you know film buff is yeah, a, but it's a is show, a... yeah and i get it it's a show about it's a show about like i get it people didn't want to watch it for although, that reason although season two is definitely more cinematic yeah season two definitely makes the i think i try to correct myself by taking it the attempt you're going to watch season two and one of the one of the proud things I, I i feel about that show season two anyways is that even the shows the episodic uh, you know, um, titles that you go through, it's going to feel like you're watching several several short movies, not a show. Now, you just said something there. Do you want to expand on that or not? Was that the Coke? Was that the Coke getting to your head? It's gone. It's gone. Okay. Okay. Um, we're, so in, we're in it now. <laughs> no, um, what I was going to say was that, uh, and again, it's been done HBO is really just fucking killing it. You, some of these shows, you feel like you're watching small movies. Well, yeah. And I, film, I, buff I, part, I, film buff part two is definitely going to feel like that. 
definitely going to feel like that. And if you've ever seen season one, this is the sequence in general that you can go forward with. And it's funny to mention that this scene, even though it ends season one, it was written to begin season two, just mm -hmm. like Back to the Future. So yeah. instead of opening with season two, I had it end with season one so that I could hit the floor with season two running. So what you see is the beginning of season two. Now we can go forward if you wanted to. Like, you can abandon, not the band and the sketches in general, there are some that should be close to your heart, but there's nothing you need to be married to in the sense that somebody could start season two, not really know a lot about season one, and have their com own complete experience with it now. It's, to, it's an attempt to see, not only if I could have different fans, but different fans aboard the show for different reasons. So for those who are fans of certain elements of season one, are they going to get a payoff in season two? Yes. I'm, I, say, <laughs> I, say, I say fortunately in the most proud way. Like, I feel like, there are, I feel like there are moments. I feel like there are moments in season two where season one fans are going to get such a bigger payoff than they expected. Uh, they're going to find themselves in a forward storytelling uh, uh, um, position with favorite characters that they have. If that makes sense, we found it a way to keep the characters. We me. found a way to keep the characters going in this new way of storytelling. Yes, there are certain characters that come back. You'd be surprised who does and who doesn't, though. Um, I, I, I definitely am focused. Like, there's an assortment of everybody, man. There's an assortment of new characters that we take risks on. There's an assortment of old characters that we love, but we don't know that we got a response with that we want to keep, you know, keep going forward with. And then there's a fabrication of who my character is, who's essentially the, and, and, and his friends and family that essentially, you know, drive the storyline. Um. Again, I, I don't know how much uh, you can talk about or how much you can say. It, there is, there are a lot of new cast members, um, and so you got to be excited about that. A, a lot of new, uh, other than obviously myself. I was going to say, which I know, are you plugging yourself? Which, which I know you're overwhelmed to have the opportunity to, uh, for, you know, work with. Who, who, who in, you know, can you talk about any? Yeah, uh, we. Uh, I, know we've got, I know we've got some phenomenal people involved. Some of them who are on board right now, who have worked in big time films. Who, uh, you know. Well, well, first off, we have our favorites. You know, Andy Andy Dubitsky comes back. Um, Andy Dubitsky has become such an embrace for the show uh, that you'd be surprised how how um, emotionally involved he becomes in season two if that makes sense, surprisingly. Of course, our, our boy Ryan comes Ryan, back. Ryan, buddy. Ryan, Ryan Miller just... comes back, and he's a big deal in it. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, oh, Ryan, speaking of the devil, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, of course, the scene stealer, of all scene stealers, comes back, which if I've already talked about Andy and I've already talked about Ryan, the only other person I'm clearly fucking talking about is my fucking boy, Jackson. Uh makes an appearance and steals it from everybody, including me, of course. Yeah. Uh, we do have new, uh, new blood, new, new blood, a uh, very impressive list of names. We have, um, Michelle Dannon who comes on board. Uh, she's a great, great, um, more of a horror genre, uh, actress. She actually has her own production company with Tara Sleen productions. And she does several short films herself. Uh, Der Michelle Dannon is uh, a very talented woman who who uh, leads the cast of Warren Hall. And let me tell you something. Warren Hall is the voice you are hearing throughout the new trailer. He's this general character. And if there ever there was an actor to be nominated for a web series, this guy took my show and turns it. He makes you, you take it serious because of this fucking guy. And his performance is... I can't gloat about it enough. What you see in the trailer is nothing. He's great. And my boy Alex is in it, who Alex is here right now. Alex is great. 
uh, Alex, like I said, is a musician first and foremost, but in the past two or three years, the turn I've seen him make into becoming a full blown artist acting behind the scenes. Uh, I think the guys, I think guys work, his work is fantastic. I can't wait for you guys to see him in this. We have the great and beautiful Ami Khan, uh, who I've been trying to get a part of this. That is, this is like my prof professional crush. I don't have a, like a problem saying that she is great. She's from La La Land. Not only from La La Land, she's a big part of, she's like one of the four main characters of La La Land. But, uh, She's also in uh, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. She's in uh, Don't Being Trust Me. Part of 23. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's got her own cult following with, uh, with uh, her Once Upon a Time uh, rock opera. Uh, well, she's fucking great. She's fucking... She's the evil witch, bro. Like, she's super fucking great in it. You do extensive work on, on her. She's, she's been great for, like, the past 10 years, probably. Maybe 10, close to 15 years. She is our Natalie Wood right now. Um, uh, we have Kayla Emerson, who is our new Tinseltown trivia girl. We have you, who is great. We have Dallas Mead. We have um, uh, Darrell is going to pop. We have a lot of people oh, on nice. top of the surprises we have. Rachel Sleek is in it. <laughs> Rachel Sleek is in it. That was a fucking, that was a, we just got hit after hit after hit of fucking great people. And to, you know, to bring this all into fruition again, I want to bring up, there's a Kickstarter account. Oh, that's, yes. That's, so that we can you know, actually, hey, Ryan. <laughs> What's happening, my brother? Uh, you guys go to uh, any of our profiles. We have links attached to it. Go to Kickstarter, look up Film Buff 2, uh, season two. And uh, throw in a little bit, like I, I, I said, uh, you know, it was my birthday wish to people. Like for me, if you would take me out and buy me a drink, uh, I don't, I don't really drink so much anymore. So put twenty dollars towards the campaign. Wish. Tell them it's your birthday. What is that? Wish. Tell them it's your birthday wish. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's, it is my birthday wish that they would, that they would give the money. It's like instead of, you know, what twenty dollars here or there, and so it's, it's those little amounts. If if shit, everybody on my friends list threw in twenty dollars would have twenty thousand dollars. You know, I think I have over over a thousand followers on Instagram and Facebook. And if everybody threw in twenty, that that would that would get us way over the top. So just uh, we are here. This is a pledge drive. <laughs> this is you know, um, if you like the programming that you see on Film Buff Show, uh, go to Kickstarter and and uh, help make a difference. And the other cool thing is, there's lots of cool shit you can get, like. You uh, have, there's uh, a there's for the first time ever, uh, there are now film buff merchandise. So, for example, you can have an anxiety the clown coffee mug like you've always wanted. You can have a pillowcase with my son's face on it like you've always wanted. <laughs> you know, you can't have a shirt with a thousand me's in the auditorium like you've always wanted. Like, there's, and for the first time, we now have uh, Ami Khan's character as part of the marketing, which is a big part of. Her character is a big part of our marketing for a reason, but uh, we're pretty proud of that. So we do have, my point is we do have some season two stuff in there. We're proud to debut. Uh, a lot of great stuff. Uh, there are opportunities to actually have a Zoom conversation with the beautiful Miss Khan. There are uh, opportunities to oh, get wow. yourself, there are opportunities to get your name included in the show somehow, or even a cameo somehow. Yep. So, yeah, so so go uh, yeah go go check that out and and help give um, please yeah that'd dude, be so great five dollars helps anything helps uh, we've been going over an hour and a half brother you know you were when we, when we were starting this thing there was this like, oh how long is it going to last we my uh, propensity for not shutting up is has taken us over an hour and yeah, a half yeah when I said that in all fairness that's when I was putting more of the liquor into the drink and so that <laughs> really had a hand in how this is going. And that's what gets us there. Yeah. Um, does anybody else know? I, I see nobody here, batter and buffer. Um, I, I noticed that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you, you know, instead of going to Starbucks, throw $10 at the account. Like, really, the, the, the littlest things, you guys, I mean, it's like, it's like the way Bernie did it. You know, it's like a lot of people giving a little, man. It, it, it really, it puts us over the top. Nobody really used the question button. We had a few people pop questions up underneath. Is there anything anybody wants to throw? Will the only other stuff I had on here? I think I, I do have a, a closing question when when we're ready for it. Um, 
It's just something silly that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, I, I was going to get into the what drew you into acting, and if you could reprise any role in cinema, what would it be? But uh, I know the second question. The what involved what involved me in the acting was the false uh, the false concept of what I thought acting was. Because I you as a kid you fall in love with film and you see actors and you think that's the movies, and so in my head I'm thinking I want to be an actor. But growing up as I. As I realized yeah. growing up, to me, the star is the writer. Like, the writer is the star of the film, but you don't know that. And so as I was getting older and kind of perfected acting, uh, uh, I, m I grew much more of a love for that, uh, for the behind-the-scenes stuff. So now here I am, and uh, a pretty decent actor who doesn't really want to be an actor, <laughs> and, and trying to push his show uh, that he really has a passion writing for. And so... Um, you know, my, so my old could, school. Go ahead, Any I'm character? Sorry. Any character? Well, if you could reprise a role, like, it, you know, it could be something we know. Maybe it's something we don't know. But because you, you have certainly got a broader palette than most uh, when it comes to cinema. But what if you could step in and uh, not necessarily, I'm not talking about doing a reboot. I'm, I'm saying, like, well, I guess that it's kind of what it would be. But, yeah, if, if, you, if you could take the reins on something, and, and write yourself in anything. Uh, okay, so... It could be the, the dragon and Pete's dragon. Like, I, I, have three, I, there, I have three of my favorite characters in film of all time. I don't necessarily know that I can play them, but I have two that I think I'd be perfect for that are aside from those three. So my three favorite characters ever in film are Doc Brown, uh, the cable guy, and Randy from Scream. Those are the three best movie characters I think ever written. But... Okay. Um, like, I would love to be them, but I don't know that Elliot, I would do justice. Yeah, Elliot. But um, the two that I probably more tailored for is Willy Wonka, obviously. Oh, um, wow. I'm obviously, there's Dude. no sense, there's no sense to me. Um, it's clearly, I'm, I, I could play Willy Wonka. And then the other that one was, uh, amazing. the other one was, uh, I have such a, 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 a love for buddy cop movies. So I could, I could play great against uh, uh, with someone. They're doing another Beverly Hills Cop, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And you can't, well, you can't, you, you can't, you can't contain this. You can't maintain a screen with Eddie Murphy. That doesn't work. Ask Dan Aykroyd. It doesn't work. Like <laughs> you can't, you can't hold your own with Eddie Murphy. It doesn't work like that. Ask Nick Nolte. See what happened to him? Nothing. Like you gotta... Dude, Trading Places was great. Yeah, Trading Places is great. But what do you remember? You remember Eddie Murphy and Jamie Lee Curtis's breasts. That's all you remember. Sure. But sure. depending on who you pair me with, I could be great in a buddy cop movie. I could fill the other side of, of a character, basically. What, uh, those, are the, those are the two. Being parents now, what are, what are, um, what's required watching for your child? Five. So his mother and I have different opinions about what he should be watching. Sure. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, I'm talking about you, uh, unless you don't want to. If this, if this crosses well, the other where I'm, I'm, I'm committed to introducing him to something new every day, and so depending on how That's he reacts important. to that, you know, because I tried to show him Land Before Time, wasn't digging it. We loved Land Before Time. I tried right. to introduce to him American Tale, wasn't digging it. We loved American Tale, Five of Goes West, sure. There's some great shit. Uh, right. I tried to show him Fern Gully. He couldn't do Fern Gully. However, he did, he did like my favorite Disney movie of all time, which was Oliver and Company, if you remember that. Okay. Loved Oliver and Company. He, he has an affection for it, but he likes YouTube. YouTube. Andrew, what's up, YouTube. buddy? Oh, YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, yeah TikTok, YouTube. YouTube. You know something I found that Fern Gully's great? Something that does, didn't really hold up well, I don't think, is uh, Spaceballs. Really, I, th I think you, you I just, that movie in particular. I think a lot of Mel. I think a lot of Mel Brooks stuff does. I love uh, Young Frankenstein. I Young love Frankenstein. Um, uh, fucking Blazing Saddles is amazing. But there's something about um, I don't know. I just thought a lot of the jokes just didn't land, and maybe it's just the time we live in now and stuff like I, that. I also um, think I also think spoofs. It's a thin line because spoofs mainly hang on the success of something else. So Star Wars clearly overshadows Spaceballs. Sure. You know, clear, clearly. Uh, 
he's alive. Um, but like, for example, how are we going to feel about scary movie, you know, 20 years down the line? Because Scream is always going to stand the test of time. Oh, and scary movie. Yeah, scary movies. This, yeah, I never, you know, I never got into those. I, uh, oh, I love them, but, but still, because they make fun of something I love. Sure, sure. The Young Frankenstein can hold its own against Frankenstein. Oh, dude, it's, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, History of the World can hold its own against the last good spoof movie. Probably not another team movie, easily. Easily. We haven't had a good spoof movie in 20 something years. No, Scary Movie 3 was the last good scary movie. Snoop Dogg. <laughs> yeah, I guess there hasn't been a, um, a spoof, like a spoof movie. Like, you, know, you know the ones I liked, and they were a lot more driven on improv. They're not really, I guess they're not really spoof movies. Those ones... What were the ones like the the best in show, the dog one, or like the waiting for Guffman, or you know the whole that whole genre of like uh, those aren't those aren't movies, I guess, but very pleasant. Charlie Sheen's actually a very pleasant in person. First one, like the more I thought I would. Um, what is that crew that does all those? And 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 what's his name's gone now? I'm just old and I can't I can't stick anything. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I don't understand how we're doing this interview right now. <laughs> we're skimming on. We're skimming on. Do you remember? Uh, we, we we went off the we went off the rails. I'm I'm done with my notes. We went off the rails. Uh, the, I I do have the I do have the closing thing when we're done. Um, guys, thank you for uh, your time. We hope to be doing these once a week. Well, so in the future, is it going to be more just you rapping or like? I'm going to try a couple on my own. I'm going to try a couple with some co-hosts. Uh, yeah. I you've had experience with this, so I clearly wanted you to kind of lead the the game. I hope we talked enough about season one, uh, and some stories about it that nobody kind of knew. Is what what is well? Let me ask you this then, man. What about season one do you want to put out there that you think is not out there? What about season one do you want to share that you feel like maybe people don't know? Uh, season one. What is season one to you? Season two is a reaction to the collision that my personal life had with season one. So what you see in season two, although it is not my life, it is the reaction to the collision from the show to my life in season sure. one. Sure. So um, because, again, these are topics we talked about that didn't have any kind of legal bindings or things like that. It involved a lot of personal uh, um, personalities, big personalities, uh, a lot of artistic, huge, creative collisions and explosions, good and bad. Andrew, um, I love you, brother. Thank you. Um, it, it's, uh, I miss you. It dude. became a huge part of my life, yeah. And um, Christopher in, good, in, in a really good Mentors, way, because I had to put a lot of myself in that. But, I mean, like I said, every topic, every actor, everybody a part of it, there's a story as to how they got there, what happened during our relationship <laughs> while they were there, and how we parted ways after the fact. Uh, not that they parted bad or good. I'm just saying when you work with somebody uh, as close as we all had on this project, uh, it, it changes a lot, you know. Um, there are some, I guess, regrets as you would have in anything, but overall, would I do it all over again? Absolutely. Like, I'd let it destroy my life if I had the chance. <laughs> like, if I had the chance, I would let it just, I just, at the time of my life. And I've never felt this way before. Yes, I swear. It's true. <laughs> and I owe it all to you. <laughs> It's music, man. Music is. I, I, I was. I, I was. I was That's thinking that earlier. Existed before. That wasn't original. I was thinking earlier about how I, I should have been a musician. I was watching old eighties rock videos on on like the old MTV, and uh, dude, you know the old rock stars were, were not good looking people, man. Even in the videos, but there is an allure. There is something, and it's almost like 
in film, everybody was beautiful, you know what I mean? But like musicians can be like me, they can be ugly and they can, they can and you can yeah. get up there. Thank you, Huey and, Lewis. And rock out that stage and have people just fall all over you. I should have been, I should have learned to sing. They were all over the 80s. It wasn't just musicians. Chevy Chase was a sex symbol at some point. Isn't that crazy to think? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, cinema brings anybody in, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to start pointing out people, but, but yes, you know, you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I mean, yeah, Bill Murray, I, guess, I guess talent is sexy. Bill, then I Bill, the Bill Murray is not bastard. necessarily, no, I'm just kidding. You, you break, like, you break Bill Murray down. People appreciate that. Corner. Steve Martin was a sex symbol. Like, you know, yeah, when the crazy over the three amigos. Steve Martin got big. Didn't he put, no, that was Howie Mandel. Put the gloves over his head and blew him up or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, I can see how you get the two confused. The, the rubber glove. <laughs> well, Steve Martin, I know Steve Martin from, from his albums, from doing freaking uh, the the Egyptian song, uh, King Tut, stuff like that. Um, that's neither here nor there. I know but, him uh, being the only 20-year-old celebrity that had white fucking hair. Was it back in the day? I think so. He had young, He was young with white hair. He just always had it. Dude, I love him and stuff. I love uh, Grand Canyon. I love L.A. Story. The Jerk. Are you kidding me? The Jerk is fucking gold. Oh, oh The Jerk's phenomenal. <laughs> you ever see oh, L.A. Story? Know. L.A. Story's great. Dude, L.A. Story and Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is just a great bit of storytelling, man. I think it's that's just... Kasdan, and I don't know that I've seen that. You should see Grand Canyon. Yeah, uh, Danny, see Danny Glover, Kevin Klein, Kevin Klein, right? It's Steve Kasdan. Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is Kasdan. It is. Kasdan. It's like the '90s Big Chill. Yeah, maybe. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, nice one. Nice, yeah. nice callback. Bowfinger. Um, Bowfinger is the like ultimate Steve Martin movie to me. Really, I gotta watch that. I never watched it. That's somebody who could hold his own with Eddie Murphy, Steve Martin. I it's gotta a watch great it. fucking movie. You gotta see that movie. You know, okay. I'm actually surprised that Instagram has allowed us to talk this long. <laughs> I'm surprised Mark Zuckerberg's not sitting there like, "All right, guys, Jesus Christ, cut this feed, <laughs> cut it, cut it, cut it." Well, we just watched all of season one. That's six fucking dude, episodes, dude. You and I could talk for hours, but dude. I don't know that anybody could listen to us talk for hours. <laughs> Well, planes, trains, wait, and automobiles. We, if we get into planes, trains, and automobiles, I'm going to go on a John Candy rant. John Candy's fucking where it's at. It's amazing this is being allowed to keep going. Yeah. Uh, if we get more than enough money through Kickstarter, yeah, again, let's uh, let's bring it back around. There's a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, what is one cameo you would what a cameo he would want on the show, or that he would want to play, Alex? What do you, or maybe answer both of those questions? Can we get a thousand in 24 hours? That's that's a challenge I'd like to see. For this one's, we could. Yeah, which one, Alex? Which one are you talking about, Alex? Well, to answer them both. What's uh, uh, on the show? On the show, but other than Keanu Reeves, uh, what? <laughs> uh, well, Keanu. Yeah, Ke I mean, I'm not going to say who else. Uh, I'm not going to say another one because there might be an opportunity that we could get him or her. So Got I'm it. not going to say that one yet. But uh, what would you another like person. On? You know what, dude? Um, I know the ultimate, but I don't want him in season two. I'd want him in the final season as Timothy Oliphant. Like, that's the ultimate for me. Like, if I get Timothy Oliphant to come on and make fun of himself for the final season, that's, I'd, I'd, be, I'd die happy. Jim Carrey is like, you know what? That's a pipe dream, but in all honesty, I don't even want to meet Jim Carrey because I love him so much. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to meet him because I love him that much. But um, yeah, Timothy Oliphant would be a, would be would be awesome. I know I can think of somebody better. Anyways, um, who I'd like to where I'd like to cameo, dude. I always think of that. Like I I would love to just be able to walk onto someone, walk out, and cause an impression, but not like an overall adjustment to the <laughs> to someone's perception of something. Like I love the concept of cameos. I would love to be Will Ferrell in Wedding Crashers, or I would love to be. Like, you know, anybody, anybody in the fight scene of Anchorman, 
Like that's that's a great cameo. <laughs> like that's a great cameo to me. Uh, that was that was amazing. <clears throat> that would be great, and it would be great, especially because nobody knows who the fuck I am. That'd be even better, even better. <laughs> ben Stiller, Luke Wilson, Vince Vaughn. Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Coleman. I come in there and you and Amy and fucking, you know what I mean? And fucking Alex is behind me. We got fucking chains and Ryan <laughs> comes up with a mustache. No, but um, uh, to me, I think I would be the best um, Frankie Avalon cameo in a Grease remake. I think I could come out and do Beauty School Dropout. Perfect. <laughs> and I don't think anybody would fucking see it coming. And it would be epic. Yeah, I honestly think that that's that's the cameo for me. That that's that's amazing. I I feel like we ought to go out on that. I would. I, you know, when we're getting off the phone here, I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fucking performing it on my bed. You just drop that. I'm gonna be dancing on there. Yeah. Um. Hey, buddy. I think. Uh, what do you think? I don't, and that's the problem. But uh, well, I I think, I think I think we should call. I was gonna ask my my final question to you was gonna be something else. I don't I don't know if I'm gonna do. Oh, it have you not asked like the final question yet? But no, the fi Well, oh yeah, yeah, let's get let's get it done because that's gonna go. Well, the final minutes. question is the final question is irrelevant and has nothing to do with anything. Okay. The final the final question is to end it off, guys. You're at the store. You're at Costco. You're shopping, right? You got your cart loaded up. You go back to the car and you unload it, right? What do you do with a shopping cart? Oh, uh, I, I, I return it. I return it to the nearest cart receptacle, but not to the store. But I don't let it, I don't let it, I don't let it wash off into the street. All right, that's fair. Unless there is a neighbor that I don't like who's shopping at the same time as me and his car is right there because then I won't get caught. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get to I'll get to stay at my home and see how upset he is as he pulls up, and I'll get that I'll get that enjoyment. So that's, I guess you know fifty fifty. That's beautiful, brother. That's beautiful, William. You say to me, dude. I I love you so much, man. I am. Thank you so much for the opportunity, guys. We're up on the Kickstarter page. Yeah, please I'm visit so grateful. Uh, the Kickstarter page. Uh, take a look at the trailer. Take a look at what we have to offer. Uh, we got a good week left, and we're pretty excited about it. Really excited to get back into uh, production. I'm super stoked. I'm super honored. I'm super honored to be involved. I'm super honored to be talking to you and having you here right now. Thank you for this. Thank um, you, guys. And we shall see you next week. You'll probably hear the announcement tomorrow. So, Yeah, dude, we went two hours. Oh, God, I'm sorry. 10 o'clock, baby, two hours. I'm sorry. If your ass is a little sore, that's... <laughs> sorry, guys. Peace. All right, brother, tap out. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> just, just it is done. Just push, yeah. It's, it's but the button. Hit the button at the top. It's, it's but then save it. But then make sure you save it. I don't know. It's. It says, "Do I want to end the vi video?" Oh, well, we never want to end the video, but it's time to go. Uh, we can do filters. Do you want to do filters? <laughs> but if I hit X, it's going to say end the video. Uh, yeah, I mean, we...